where are you from? Um, which which pizza place you're on? Pepperoni. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. Nino's. <laughs> In my district, yay. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, here we go. Okay, all here. Okay, we're going to start. Okay. Other members coming, Jacob? Yep. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, on today's agenda, I'm joined by my good friend, Councilmember Debbie Rhodes, who looks amazing. Oh, um, uh, the council will vote on the one Article 11 property tax exemption at 645 Barreto Street in Councilmember Rafael Salmanca's district in the Bronx. It will preserve 48 affordable housing units. The council will vote on the following land use items. The first three projects are in Councilmember Van Bramer's district, Long Island City ramps, the approval of approval of two special permits to facilitate the construction of two new residential buildings with 481 units. 150 of those units will be affordable. Hunters Point South, an Article 11 tax exemption and a modification uh, of a previously approved project with deeper levels of affordability and the inclusion of two, two new schools. Uh, and 11, 14, 35 Avenue rezoning. It's gonna be a rezoning that will allow for a mixed use development with 74 units and 22 of those uh, will be affordable uh, when he arrives. Uh, he can speak on these items. Uh, next, a bunch of uh, land use applications. I'm not gonna give you the details on all of them unless you wanna talk about them. I'm just gonna give you the addresses. Uh, 111 East 16th Street, it's uh, a mixed use development in Council Member Rivera's district. 6902 Queens Boulevard, it's a rezoning, which is gonna include a 476 seat public school in Council Member Holden's district. Sunset Park Article 11s, uh, these are multiple Article 11s in Council Member Menchaca's district. Hopkins, Hopkinson Park Place. Uh, it's a home ownership project in Council Member Alika Ampre Samuels District. 21 Arden Street, Article 11 in Council Member Idanis Rodriguez's District. Variety Boys and Girls Club. It is a rezoning uh, for a new building with affordable housing uh, in Astoria. It's a new space for the Boys and Girls Club of Astoria located in Council Member Costa Constantinides' District. Uh, 3901 Ninth Avenue, it's a rezoning in Council Member Carl Smanchaka's district uh, that will facilitate the development of a six-story mixed-use building. The council will also vote on disapproving the transfer of properties in Council Members Carlina Rivera, Diana Ayala, Idanis Rodriguez, Bill Perkins, and Mark Levine's district under the Third Party Transfer Program, also known as TPT. Under the current law, the council may disapprove the transfer of any property within 45 days of receiving official notice from the Department of Finance of the list of properties scheduled to go through the TPT program. The TPT program is an anti-displacement program designed to stabilize and rehabilitate buildings and improve conditions uh, for uh, tenants. Decisions to remove individual projects from the list were made by the local council members whose districts these developments are in, these buildings are in. Uh, the, this round of TPT involves properties in Manhattan. Those council members met with the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and in many cases, representatives of the properties in order to make their decisions. The council recognizes that some communities who recently went through the TPT process in uh, other boroughs, Brooklyn, Bronx, uh, and Queens, I don't think there were any in Staten Island in Council Member Rose's district, um, have raised concerns regarding the program. And as a result of those concerns, the council will be, make, will be reviewing uh, TPT legislation and HPD practice to make changes as necessary to ensure that the program remains a viable rehabilitation and preservation tool to improve the lives of residents in these buildings and to ensure that the buildings remain affordable for many years to come. Uh, we're gonna vote on the following pieces of legislation today. Introduction 925A, sponsored by Councilmember Jumani Williams, will clarify that when a commuter van is operating in violation of a provision within the TLC's commuter van enforcement authority, the TLC will have the power to seize that vehicle regardless of seating capacity. This bill would also amend the definition of a for hire vehicle so that for enforcement purposes, the definition includes vehicles with a seating capacity greater than 20. These amendments will allow for the TLC to enforce against vehicles that seat more than 20 passengers. Uh, whether they are commuter vans or for hire vehicles. And uh, when Councilman Williams arrives, uh, he can speak on this legislation. Next, we're gonna vote on a few building related bills. Introduction uh, 465 
A, sponsored by Council Member Danny Drum, will require the Department of Buildings and the Commission on Human Rights to conduct yeah. education and outreach to businesses and the public to increase awareness of the existing requirement that single occupant toilet rooms be available for use by persons of any gender, as well as the related posting and signage requirements of such toilet programs, toilet rooms. I invite Councilmember Drum to come up and speak on this bill. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, when our city commits to creating a more equitable environment for transgender and gender non-conforming community, it needs to follow up and to act. Local Law 79 of 2016 was, we thought, one very practical way to show our commitment. This law was aimed at ensuring single store restrooms have all gender signage. Unfortunately, as my office's research and the initial committee hearing revealed, the Department of Buildings has not fully embraced the spirit, if not the letter of the law. Buildings and business owners in my district and throughout the city are either unaware of the law or are flouting the requirement with no seeming consequence. Many individuals looking to use all gender restrooms are similarly unaware. Intro 465A will require the department to establish and implement an education and outreach program to increase awareness of Local Law 79 and to issue an annual report on the implementation and uh, of its efforts. Without proper ed uh, education and enforcement, Local Law 79 is nothing but a symbolic gesture. Transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers need more than symbolism. I thank Committee Chair Robert Cornegie, Caitlin Fahey, and the many human rights advocates who have worked on this. Finally, I have to acknowledge the speaker, of course, for his steadfast leadership in all things LGBTQ. And also just to say that if you find a restroom that is not properly identified, you can call it into 311 now, which is something we also had to work with the Department of Buildings on as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Shimani, if you want to come up, I uh, just spoke about the commuter van uh, bill, if you want to speak on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, today we're passing into 925A, a bill that, which will enable the TLC to exercise enforcement over commuter vans, which have over 20 seats, closing a loophole that allowed bad actors to take advantage of the system and escape enforcement. This has been unsafe for riders and has been damaging to small business owners who operate legitimately and in good faith. Passing legislation will ensure that commuter van operators follow all, all of the existing regulations. This legislation will also uh, help enforcement on such vehicles while keeping the legal operational requirement at a maximum of 20 seats. Again, I want to thank uh, uh, Leroy Morrison, Hector Ricketts, the speaker, all of his staff, uh, and uh, my staff, uh, Malik Wright. Passing this bill will require everyone to operate within the same regulations and on a level playing field, allow enforcement against those who violate these rules. Bad actors attempting to circumvent the law will, with law, with unsafe larger vehicles present a danger to the public and to hardworking legitimate small businesses owners and operating in good faith and providing important service. The legislation will combat those actions. Uh, this council in particular has done so much to uh, bring this industry out of the shadows and so I'm very proud of that. We continue to support those that are insured, those who have the proper licenses and providing services in parts of the city that don't have the service. Uh, all this bill does uh, is make sure that they have a, a fair way to operate and make the public safer. Um, what we've seen is people with no licenses, no insurances, don't know who they are, driving vans and the TLC can do absolutely nothing about it. Uh, I'm generally not comfortable uh, with enforcement bills without providing a way for people to make a living. The council has done that. There is a legal way to provide these services, so we're asking all uh, van operators to avail themselves of the legal way that's there. We simply can't just allow people who don't have the proper credentials and no insurances uh, to put the uh, public at risk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jumani. Uh, next is going to be introduction 644A, which is sponsored by uh, Councilmember Matthew Eugene. It will expand the building code's carbon monoxide detector requirements to all businesses and mercantile spaces. In addition, this bill will make the building code's carbon monoxide detector requirements retroactive, applying them to all new and existing uh, covered buildings equipped with fire alarm systems, which must comply with the retroactive requirement by January 1st, 2021. Finally, the bill will require the Department of Buildings to promulgate rules addressing the installation of the specific carbon monoxide detectors required and potential methods on alternative compliance for existing buildings. I invite Councilmember Eugene to come up and speak on his bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
Today we are going to vote on a very important bill. And first I want to thank uh, the Speaker Johnson and my, all my colleagues from the City Council, the co-sponsors of Intro 644A, making it a requirement for carbon monoxide detectors to be included in business and mercantile spaces. This critically important legislation will make the building codes carbon monoxide detectors retroactive, which means that uh, the detectors must be installed in both new and existing covered buildings that are equipped with a fire alarm system. This legislation is a very important step in preventing incidents of carbon monoxide poisoning in commercial spaces. And 644A will also require that the Department of Buildings promote rules that address the installation of the specific carbon monoxide detectors mandated by the law and other ways in which existing buildings can be in compliance. It is important that uh, we create an environment for our businesses that promotes safety and does not leave our business owners susceptible to the risk of accidental carbon monoxide leaks. This legislation once enacted will unquestionably save lives. A study conducted by the Center for Disease and Control found that a total of 5,149 deaths in the United States were a result of unintentional carbon monoxide poisoning from 1999 to 2010, which calculate to 430 deaths a year. In New York City, more than 400 people were hospitalized and 30 died from carbon monoxide poisoning from 2000 to uh, 2005, as reported by the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. As you can see, far too many lives are tragically and unnecessary loss in the United States and in the city of New York every year due to unintentional carbon monoxide poisoning. And this is a very good bill designed to save life. And I want to thank again uh, Speaker Johnson and all the co-sponsors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, next, introduction 899A, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers and uh, co-sponsored, uh, co-primed with our Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, will permit non-public campaign funds to be spent, this is a CFB bill, to be spent on child care services for children under 13 years old of age in an election year and in the uh, year immediately preceding the election year when the need for such service exists because of a campaign-related event or because of campaign work, uh, such childcare expenses would be exempted from the expenditure limit and the first, uh, for the first $20,000 spent in the election year, candidates would not be required to spend campaign funds uh, on childcare uh, and choosing to pay with their personal funds or receiving below market child care would not be considered a contribution to the campaign. I want to invite Councilmember Powers as well as Majority Leader Cumbo, if she would like to speak on it. First, Councilmember Powers to discuss Mr. this very, very exciting, important Thank bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today, and I'm, I want to thank my, my, uh, my colleagues for for their support of 899, a bill that I introduced from the Majority Leader Combo to allow candidates use to campaign funds to cover certain child care expenses. Um, if you've been paying attention, this really comes on the heels of an FEC decision that allowed a federal candidate who's running for office right now, Luba Gretchen Shirley, to uh, allow her to use child care expenses as part of her campaign. It also comes on the heels of a recent decision at the state level to also allow that. So today, New York City is joining both the FEC and the state in allowing candidates who want to run for office to be able to, to, to use campaign funds, non-public campaign funds, uh, for um, for child care expenses. Um, I don't. I think it's obvious why this is really important, but I'll repeat it anyway. Um, especially as we head towards a, a an election in 2021, where we are going to be a losing something like 35 members of this body, many who I will be sad to, to go, but uh, I know are are, are going to be upward uh, upward. Um, 
Um, we have, I think, a great responsibility in this city to make sure that anybody who wants to run for office has that opportunity to do so and can take advantage of, uh, of that opportunity. And with this bill today, I think, will help more people look at public office as something, not that they aspire to, but that they can actually achieve by allowing them to not look at their parenting uh, as a barrier to running for office. And we also have a great respons responsibility, in my opinion, to also make sure that we have a gender diversity in this body, which is something that I think we are lacking here today. And, and I think this bill particularly helps women um, uh, who want to run for office. And we, as we head towards 2021 and beyond, want to make sure this body is reflective of this great city that we live in. And I think this will be a step towards that. I can tell you from personal experience last year that it is a difficult decision to make when you want to run for office. You have to look at both your, uh, both all the things that it takes to run a campaign, including raising money, but also the financial decision about what, what it, the impact it has on your own personal life. And we don't want childcare to be one of those considerations. So uh, we want it to be a consideration, but we want you to be able to achieve it. So I am really thankful to the speaker for his support of this bill. I want to just note one thing is this was a really uh, good bill and we had a really good discussion on it and I want to thank a number of the colleagues who some who aren't here today who really had a lot of input because everybody had to do this had to run for office and as we discussed it um, we had a lot of good inputs from it and I want to thank the speaker particularly for allowing those voices all to come together and say here's what we really think a good program would be around this and so I'm really uh, uh, excited that we're passing it today um, I am available for babysitting unfortunately <laughs> I can't I can't make money for that so I will do for free, um, but uh, I also want to. I know. I, as I, said, um, I also want to thank um, uh, all the council members here. I want to especially note Majority, uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who this is also, I think, a personal issue for you, well, as a new mother. Um, I also want to thank Councilmember Rosenthal, who has driven this message, I think, home. We need more women in the city council, and we look forward to doing that in the coming years. So thank you, and thank you to Mr. Speaker for for putting this bill for vote today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Halloween to everyone. I love the costumes and the creativity I'm seeing. My son today is Batman. Yeah. You may have seen him earlier as Cookie Monster, but that costume was too hot for daycare today, so he had to get another costume uh, for today. Uh, thank you. He'll soon make his debut as uh, Batman. <laughs> I'm just so proud of this bill. This is such an incredible opportunity for us to not just pay lip service to the fact that we want more women in office, but we're actually passing legislation that's going to demonstrate that we're trying to level the playing field and trying to rid the barriers that so many women face when they run for office. When we go all throughout the city, one of the issues that women discuss in terms of uh, not wanting to run for office is how are they going to care for their child? And I remember very clearly clearly on election day. Uh, for me as a new mom, I had a two month old and from six o'clock in the morning uh, till nine o'clock that night and then an election night party, uh, Prince went with me to every polling site, to every senior center, all throughout the district. I was breastfeeding in the car, I was watching him and it was really a challenge, a beautiful experience that I would not trade for the world, but it was certainly very difficult to run for office having a newborn. And so this is going to be very important legislation to level that playing field. Uh, for me, I was fortunate that I had a, an entire team of people supporting me. Not everyone is going to have Speaker Corey Johnson babysitting their child like I did and doing their train stations and knocking on doors for me um, and sliding leaflets under every development in my district. But we have to make sure that women are given a message loud and clear that we want your voice, we want your input, we want your representation here in City Hall and all throughout the nation. So I'm very proud to work with Councilmember Powers on this. I'm so inspired that we have so many dynamic men who recognize the importance of equality and making sure that women's voices are an equal partner with our men all throughout city government. So I applaud you again. Speaker Corey Johnson for being such a dynamic babysitter. And it's good to know that Keith Powers has also come forward to say that he has those same interests. So thank you all so very much. Thanks, Lori. Uh, finally, the council is gonna vote on a very, very, very important package of legislation uh, that will improve the NYPD's response to victims of sexual assault 
and gender-based harassment. As we end Domestic Violence Awareness Month, it's important, very important, for all survivors of violence, domestic and gender-based, that we stand up with them and that we are here to help them as a city. Our commitment to helping survivors continues today with these bills by ensuring that the NYPD not only protects survivors to the fullest extent, but is also understanding their needs. Um, before I read you the bills, I just want to just <coughs> let you know that Councilmember Rosenthal, uh, who chairs our Women's Committee, and Councilmember Rose, and Councilmember Cumbo, and Councilmember Rivera, who's not here, all of the women members of the council, have spent such an enormous amount of time on these bills. Um, they have spent a huge amount of time with the NYPD, with advocates, um, with people who have been uh, survivors, um, and I am really proud of the work that they've done. Uh, we know that the Special Victims Division needed some significant changes uh, in the wake of not just a DOI report, but also the experiences that we're hearing from survivors and victims. And so this package of bills is so, so, so important. Um, and I'm really proud of, the, uh, of my colleagues here today who have worked so hard on this. So the first introduction is introduction uh, 444A, sponsored by Majority Leader Cumbo. It will require that new recruits in the NYPD receive specialized training for responding to survivors of sexual assault and harassment, including sensitivity to differences in culture, gender, gender expression, and sexual orientation. The bill will also require interactive refresher trainings every two years for all uniform members of the department who regularly interact with crime victims and survivors. And I want to invite the majority leader to come up and speak on this important bill. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson. This is certainly a revolutionary bill. In the Me Too movement, it's so important that we match that with legislation that's going to give individuals all throughout the city and hopefully in this nation real tools to be able to come forward. For so many, the first point of contact after a horrific situation of sexual assault is a New York City police officer. And what we want to do through this legislation is making sure that we do all that we can so that victims feel supported all along the way. One of the things that we have seen so often is that so many victims do not come forward. And we want to change that dynamic through this piece of legislation. It's going to require all NYPD officers, all NYPD officers, to receive sensitivity training to assist them in responding to victims of harassment and sexual assault. This bill is part of a larger package of legislation being put forward today, which seeks to improve the Special Victims Division and the handling our city's response to survivors of sexual crimes. We live in a society that is still permeated by rape culture, and that is sadly reflected in so many institutions. This package represents an opportunity for us to move forward in the right direction, one that cases of sexual assault and violence with the utmost seriousness and treats victims with the respect, the courtesy, and the sensitivity that you so desperately need following what is probably the most horrific situation to ever happen in someone's life. We could have not gotten to this point without survivors who so boldly and courageously shared their stories along with other advocates and service providers who showed us the way to truly transformative change. Our city is better for it. I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal, Rose, Rivera, and Richards for their leadership on this effort. I want to thank Gail Black on my team as well as Monica Aben who have shepherded this particular legislation all the way to this point today. This is huge for the city of New York. This is huge for women, this is huge for men, the LGBT community, and all citizens across the city of New York. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson, and I'm so proud to be a member of the Women's Caucus. We are continuing to raise critical issues and making a change in New York City. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Uh, next is introduction 785A, sponsored by our amazing uh, chair of the Women's Committee and someone who has spent an enormous, an enormous amount of time on this, and it will require, her bill will require the department, uh, the NYPD, to create a comprehensive special victims training program for, new, for uh, new special victims division investigators within six months. 
The bill would establish a core set of training components, which will include skill demonstrations and proficiency examinations for all new SVD investigators. The bill will also require current SVD investigators to demonstrate proficiency in all of these core subjects within 18 months. Finally, the bill will require annual reporting on the content, the number of officers participating, and any changes that are made to the program. I want to invite uh, Helen Rosenthal to come up and speak on her bill. Thank you so much, Speaker. Oh, <laughs> that's really nice. Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, two, of, two of you in particular are a little scary to look at. <laughs> um, but I appreciate you, and I already took a picture. Uh, so, you know, I had the privilege of co-chairing a hearing with Councilmember Donovan Richards, who oversees the NYPD uh, as an agency, and we learned from victims and survivors of sexual violence uh, about not only the trauma they go through as a victim, but then re-traumatization as they report uh, what has happened to them. And you know, you don't need me to repeat what's being written about in the paper every day now about how victims are treated. It's so important that our police commissioner, Jimmy O'Neill, apologized for uh, the missteps that were taken after the 1994 Prospect Park rape case. Uh, he did that with the same uh, graciousness that he gives to advocates um, every day and to survivors. He is a true champion in trying to change the way that the PD responds to uh, victims, helping them to help them come along the track to become a survivor. I was delighted to hear that since our hearing, the PD has really stepped up and started giving this training to their SVD uh, detectives. In fact, so much so that at a meeting yesterday with the advocates, they thanked the commissioner because more recently they had had survivors coming into their offices saying that they had a positive experience mm -hmm. with the Special Victims Division. And that is light years from where we were just a few months ago. And if I could just be very specific for one second, um, the training components will include FETI, the Forensic Experiential Trauma Interview Method, specialized investigative training for sexual assault cases, including non-stranger sexual assault, just as important, a rape is a rape, no matter if it's by an acquaintance, a domestic partner, or a stranger, it's just equally as traumatizing. Um, district attorney-based training related to legal evidentiary standards um, and sexual assault forensic examiner training, sex offender registration act training, hospital-based training, so they know what to do when they're going, they're called into the emergency room to meet with a victim just after something has happened. And something I'm very excited about, the victim advocate-based training where for a week-long uh, training program, the detectives themselves will learn about what it's like to be an advocate on behalf of these victims. Um, one more detail. <laughs> so these trainings address some very important specifics, the depth of victimization, the negative social consequences of sexual assault, the trauma and neurobiological damage inflicted by sexual assault, the complexity of victim management, the falsity or partial truthful disclosure of complainants. You know, the Special Victims Division is unique to the NYPD. They're not there just to solve the crime. They're there as a first respondent to a victim and to help them as they go along the road to become a survivor. That's right. The speaker of this council gets that, the commissioner gets that, um, 
the lawyers, David Addis and Brian Crow, thank you so much for your work, and of course to my legislative director, Ned Terrace. Really appreciate all your work in getting into the weeds on this and making sure that our PD will be the best they can be in their response. Thank you very much. Uh, next, introduction 781A, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, will require that the police commissioner limit access to SVD files to individuals who need to see those case files in order to perform certain uh, job functions. It would also require the system to keep a record of every instance in which an individual accesses an SVD case file to ensure the traceability of any leaks and to discourage potential leaking of crime victim information. It will further require the department to audit the system quarterly to identify and pursue leaks and report the results of these audits to the council. If Councilmember Rivera comes, I'm happy to have her speak on this bill. And then lastly, introduction uh, 784A, sponsored by Councilmember Debbie Rose, will require the department to report on the staffing and caseloads for SVD investigators, disaggregated by borough and unit within the SVD, and also disaggregated by the types of cases being handled. The report will also include the factors the commissioner considered in setting staffing levels for the SVD, and I invite Councilman Rose to come up and speak on her bill. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I, I think it's really critically important to understand that the passage of these bills today would not have been possible without the leadership of our speaker, Corey Johnson, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that he understands the importance of this issue and he gave us his undying support and helped to mediate conversations with NYPD. I'm really thankful to, to the speaker for, for helping us shepherd these through. This spring, the Department of Investigation released a disturbing report that found that while more than 70% of crimes overall in New York City are reported to authorities, only five to 20% of sexual assaults are reported. Among the many reasons for this unacceptably low number is the gross understaffing of the special victims divisions in NYPD. The same Department of Investigation report found that only 67 detectives were available to investigate roughly 5,600 sex crimes per year. In the era of Me Too, when more and more sexual assaults are being reported, it's imperative that victims are able to feel confident that their cases will be investigated in a timely and sensitive manner. Otherwise, these victims become re-victimized. The time, this time by justice, by the justice system that fails them. Intro 784A will bring us closer to rectifying this situation. The bill we are voting on today will require that the NYPD report annually on staffing levels for special victims divisions. It is my hope that this bill will help to ensure that the NYPD is equipped with the necessary resources to investigate sex crimes that have not been given the proper attention in the past. This and other SVD bills being voted on today will address this situation so that victims can feel confident that their cases will move forward in a sensitive, efficient um, way forward. And I just wanna again thank the speaker. I wanna thank the leadership of Council Member Rosenthal, who is the chair of the Women's Committee she was undaunted yes. and, and she would not be stopped. And I wanna thank my other council members who worked on these bills, um, Majority Leader Cumbo and the Women's Caucus. Thank you. Thank you, thank Debbie. You. Congratulations. Thank you, Debbie. And then uh, lastly, uh, we mentioned uh, a bunch of um, exciting and important land use matters all happening in Councilmember Van Bamber's district. These were not uh, easy things to get done. He spent an enormous 
amount of time getting a lot for his community, so I want to invite him to speak on this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, for your help. And uh, I want to uh, highlight uh, Jason Goldman and Raju Man, who uh, worked with me very closely on all of the above. So today we have three significant land use uh, items in my district that we are voting on. And uh, I want to stress that the announcement by the administration yesterday uh, to add $180 million in funding for infrastructure uh, for uh, the district and for Long Island City specifically is unrelated to uh, these items. But just to go over what we've done uh, to try and address the shortage of infrastructure while also meaningful, meaningfully increasing the amount of affordable housing in Long Island City. Uh, we're doing a Hunters Point South UDAP. Uh, this is a 5,000 unit uh, development that had been approved in the previous council, but we are actually uh, changing uh, that development with this vote today in some incredibly important ways. Uh, number one, we are lowering the AMIs uh, for the affordable housing and we're actually increasing the number of affordable housing units from 2,075 to 2,446. That's almost 2,500 affordable units in this one UDAP. But the previous uh, council, long before anyone here was in the council, had voted to approve these 5,000 units without the inclusion of one new school. So with this today, we are approving not one, but two brand new schools for this community. Thank you very much to my colleagues. Uh, so this is an incredibly important, more affordable housing, better affordable housing, and two desperately needed schools. We also have a much smaller uh, 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 rezoning that's going on right by the Ravenswood houses that is going to include uh, a significant number of affordable units in a 116 unit building. And then finally, uh, and this we have fought so incredibly hard for so many years, the Jackson Avenue ramps project in Long Island City, but specifically Court Square, a community that too uh, for too long had been uh, ignored uh, by previous administrations. We are very proud of the fact that with this vote today, not only will we gain another 150 affordable units of housing, but and another additional school, uh, UPK through five, new school for the Court Square community, and something that this community has fought for. Uh, the Queensboro Bridge that so many of you know uh, comes through Court Square and underneath those ramps, uh, the Department of Transportation and other agency have used for parking lots for their vehicles. This is publicly owned land. This community and the Court Square Civic Association have asked and demanded that the land under those ramps be returned to the community because there's a shortage of open space and park space. And as a result of this agreement today, we have secured 50,000 square feet of the ramps and the relocation of both Department of Transportation and NYPD school safety vehicles and have that park and open space fully funded by the developer. Yeah. That is an incredibly important uh, move. And I want to say that the Court Square Civic Association praised this deal when we announced it. How many times do we get that? Um, so we're very, very proud of the work that we've done. You hear Shady Honan laugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, all of this uh, means uh, nearly uh, 3,000 affordable units added in Western Queens, three brand new schools, uh, a new park fully funded, uh, and a community respected. And the $180 million that was added yesterday, uh, uh, while some of that is is uh, is a part of this. Uh, the new school in Court Square is included in that. The rest of it unrelated to any future land use items that this administration may contemplate. But these are good things. And again, I want to thank the speaker and Jason Goldman and Raju and of course my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, who worked incredibly hard, but most of all my constituents in Court Square and Long Island City who kept demanding, who kept fighting, kept demanding the infrastructure that they rightfully deserve. And that's what we're doing today, so thank you. Uh, so as you can see, a lot uh, on uh, today's agenda. I, I also want to thank, this was 
not uh, easy what Jimmy was able to get in the final negotiations. And Jason Goldman and Raju Mann spent an enormous amount of time with him on, on weekends and at nights, late at night, negotiating this. So I want to thank them as well. And I want to thank all the incredible staff that is here that worked on all of these bills. Uh, we can't do this work without all of you, so I want to thank you all. And with that, that's uh, today's agenda. So we're happy to take on-topic questions uh, first on any of these bills. Uh, the Hamburglar. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm happy to also let uh, the other council members here speak on this, but my understanding is that the review is not complete yet, but as part of what they have been looking at in the review, that is how we were negotiating these bills. Um, you know, myself and uh, I, I don't know if Councilmember Cumber was able to be there that day, but I know Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Rivera were with uh, me just a couple weeks ago. We met with the police commissioner at One Police Plaza specifically about these bills, specifically about SVD and the review that they've been undertaking. I don't think there's a final report yet, but I would characterize the conversation as a good conversation where progress is being made. They were thoughtful and responsive to the very smart questions that my colleagues had, and they were very tough and firm, but also it was a good dialogue back and forth. So we look forward to seeing that report. We told them that we actually want to play a role in what those final recommendations are, and we want advocates, survivors, and victims to play a role in what that final report looks like. And I think that was a very important moment for us. But uh, Helen was really the person who kind of led this, so I'm happy to let her speak on this as well, on some of the conversations <laughs> we've had. Um, I don't know how not to repeat what you said. Um, all of that is true. I think that uh, the one specific I could give is that I do think um, the police department is trying to find more detectives to catch adult cases. Um, that is, of course, very important. Um, I know that. <laughs> uh, I, where they come from, I know less about. Um, you know, whether or not they're in the Special Victims Division itself, um, or whether they're doing some uh, civilianizations, which I know they were able to do. I think there were four positions that where detectives mm -hmm. were doing work that secretaries could be doing, and mm -hmm. they brought in the secretaries now mm -hmm. to do that work. Thank you. And that conversation, you, that conversation, Very that conversation also included Chief Shea of the Detective Squad, uh, as well as other top uh, brass from the SVD and the Detective Squad, and we had a very free-flowing, good conversation mm -hmm. about these issues. I mean, again, I want to let uh, the, the amazing women on the council who work so hard on this speak on this. I'll just say one thing, and I think Debbie's bill goes to kind of the thing that you just asked about, Jillian. But I, I would say that one of the most disturbing things in this entire conversation has been, um, and I don't think that it was purposeful, but it had very real life consequences, I believe, not having the number of detectives necessary in that division to be able to do the casework, not just on existing cases, but as you said, cases where people come forward and talk about things that happened to them years ago and needing the requisite number of detectives to do that level of work. And so we've seen an increase in the detectives since the DOI report came out. And I think us, those of us here are hopeful that we're gonna see a further increase in the number of detectives because of the reporting that's happened. But Debbie, do you wanna say something on this? Um, yeah, the advent of the Me Too 
actually brought about an awareness that women can come up, come forward, and lend voice to um, the previous things that have happened to them. And so we saw that there might have, there has been a big uptick in reporting these crimes, whereas they might have been this, at the same level previously, but women have found their voice and are empowered to do so. And so with that, we found that there, there was a grossly disproportionate number of detectives that were there capable of doing the work. There were a lot of cold case files that hadn't been solved, and it was pretty much predicated on the fact that there were not enough detectives in that unit. I was really pleased with the conversation with the, the police commissioner to find that they had recognized that and they have already began to try to change that and they've already assigned 34 detectives to that unit that previously was not there. So um, the, we believe that the underreporting or the lack of reporting was um, predicated on the fact that things were not happening and that it was necessary that we had adequate staffing. And Helen? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanna give a shout out to the press for asking about this all the time. And I think that's been incredibly important and incredibly helpful. Um, the, the detective that solved the prospect Park uh, case, which was a cold case, uh, was Chief Detective, um, or Chief of Division uh, Detective Osgood, and it goes to show how important it is to have a cold case squad. Um, there are over 6,000 cold cases out there uh, where there's been um, uh, no resolution and um, I just wanna stress the importance, and I heard this from the advocates yesterday, the importance of the cold case squad. Um, so so um, I'm actually not sure where the staffing level is on the cold case squad and whether or not, what, what's happening there. So I just wanna reiterate uh, your, your role in all of this and appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Tell, tell me your name, I'm, I apologize. Oh. Sure, uh, tell me your name, I apologize for not knowing. Okay, great, thanks for being here, Sheila, welcome. Um, I, I can't uh, fully, uh, I can't think, give a, a, a full answer on the amount of dialogue that's happened. I mean, me personally, I'm against uh, Proposition 3 because um, I believe that uh, if a community board member is not a good fit, a council member or a borough president could decide not to reappoint that person uh, for real reasons. Uh, so I think that there's already a check in place and um, these people are volunteers. Uh, a lot of them are real community activists that have a pulse on the local community. They may have some land use expertise or housing expertise or social service expertise or transportation expertise. And I wouldn't want to lose them if they're doing a good job and they are a good community board member. Um, but if someone's not doing a good job, the council member or borough president could say, we want to make a change. They're absent, they're, they're, uh, they're not participating in a meaningful way. So um, I can't, I can tell you that I have uh, uh, four local community boards, and I've heard from a lot of community board members concerned about uh, this process. Um, but I also think it opens up the conversation, which is not a bad thing, about us needing to recruit new people and young people and new people who move to neighborhoods to participate in community boards, and that's a good thing. Proposal two, I'm, I'm supportive of. I actually think it's a good thing. I'm not gonna get into all the specifics. Um, and I'm supportive of proposal one. I can't speak for all my colleagues. If we asked everyone, everyone might have different opinions on all of these. So maybe you can ask them afterwards. Uh, but I think you've seen uh, Borough President Brewer organize an uh, independent expenditure opposed to uh, proposals uh, two and three. And I think you've seen uh, a bunch of community board members who are organizing against this as well. Any follow up, you okay? Yeah, okay, Summer. Uh, if the proposal process is approved by the community, can we be 
No, I would not do that. I would not urge this commission to reverse what the voters have decided. I think it's important to live by the will of the voters. Matt? It's a good question. I'm happy to check. I don't have an update. Do you but expect that to be fully public? You know, Matt, I haven't thought enough about it. I think it probably should be public, given that it was a very public incident. Um, and it was, uh, there was a lot of video, and it happened right here on Broadway outside of City Hall. And, um, you know, Councilman Williams decided to go to trial on this. Um, so, uh, I need to kind of do a little bit more on understanding precedent around that, but again, typically I think that on investigations like this, transparency is incredibly important, and there was a lot of reporting on it and a lot of reporters that were there when the incident happened, so uh, that's sort of my, my general lean on it. Uh, but I'm happy to ask for uh, an update and see if we can get anything. I mean, I... I, I need to reach out to the NYPD and have a conversation with them. I don't want to prejudge it. I, uh, thank you for bringing it up. I hadn't thought about it in a while, um, but I think it is important for us to understand um, what happened because I was there that day and I was disturbed by, uh, by what I witnessed. And again, I think it was not just um, specific members of the NYPD, but the Homeland Security uh, uh, law enforcement officials um, that came out of Federal Plaza, I think were the folks that really set a bad atmosphere from the start and that continued on to Broadway and down Broadway just outside of City Hall. And so it would be helpful to understand um, what the NYPD has discovered so that this doesn't happen in the future. Rosa? Not all of it, but a lot of it. I mean, I'm wondering if it's about your concern, if you have concerns about, especially about the part about what you said to the council and whether you should be giving them more information. And then also, you know, Pat Martini said there were rumors about the mayor's kind of position on him. You know, that list assembled, that the, you know, the council had that list of all of our leaders' potential things. Like, what could happen here? I think the charter is clear on what can happen um, if the mayor decides to take action on this. From the parts of the report that I read, I'm disturbed by uh, some of the actions that were taken by the DOI commissioner. I do think that DOI needs to remain an independent um, body, and I think they have done uh, some good work, but I think that there were disturbing allegations uh, that um, are in the McGovern report, and um, well, there was uh, again. I haven't read the entire report, but there was some very specific language around abuse of authority, and uh, Commissioner Peters, I know, has um, gone along with the recommendations at the end of the McGovern report and said that he would put a file in his file um, apologizing and a real admonishment of what happened. He reinstated Anastasia Coleman and her deputy at the Special Commissioner Investigations Office at the Department of Investigation. Uh, but there was language in that McGovern report related to abuse of authority. Um, and there was also language related to uh, testimony at a council hearing. Um, I think some of the folks here are looking at that testimony. Um, and. Um, also looking at the report to see how we put the piece together, but we're still reviewing things. Do you think staff, council staff are doing their due diligence by... My special counsel, Rob Newman, is someone who has been working on this and looking at uh, the testimony and the transcripts of our hearings and how that squares with the McGovern report. I don't want to. I don't want to get down the road of if, um, but you know, I, I think there were some disturbing things in that report from the parts that I read of it. Scott Martini said you'd be disturbed if the mayor gave him a spy report and got rid of him. What would happen? I, th I think that depends on the reasons that were given. You know, there would need to be 
a, a, a rationale and a basis, and I, I haven't heard that from the administration on this, and so I'm uh, withholding judgment, um, continuing to review the report, looking at the transcripts, and wanting to ensure that we have an independent DOI, but also I think it's important that um, things like this do not happen at DOI. I mean, DOI is the place that whistleblowers are supposed to go, and what that report said is that the rights of whistleblowers were um, violated. I'm not here to tell the mayor when he should or should not read things, but um, I, I, ass I assume given what I read, the parts that I read of the report, and I read most of it, I think it's 150 pages, and I think I read over 100 pages of it. Um, his deputy mayor, Dean Fullahan, and his corporation counsel, uh, Zachary Carter, were deeply involved in um, understanding what was happening in the wake of the allegations that came forward earlier this year on the firing of Anastasia Coleman and her deputy at SCI. So I think the, I would assume that the mayor has had, I would think, many conversations with his first deputy mayor and with his corporation counsel. Caleb? Uh, I just want to understand clearly the, the motivation for the review of the testimony. Are you trying to determine if she provided accurate, honest testimony? The report, the McGovern report said very specific things about his testimony at uh, a preliminary budget hearing earlier this year related to questions that came from Councilmember Torres and Councilmember Lander. Um, and the McGovern report characterized uh, his testimony in a certain way. And uh, I don't take that report to be gospel, but I think that it's important for us to follow up on what that report said and to see if it squares of the interpretation of the staff and the lawyers here. I Summer? I follow up to the public hearing that that report. That's too early to talk about any of that. Okay, any more on topic? Okay. I have more on topic. Okay, on topic, go ahead. So I'm happy to let some of the members speak on this, but I'll just say, you know, I'm really proud. I, I, I don't say this in a negative way towards an, anyone here, because there's a lot of stuff in the budget. But one of the things I'm really proud of in the budget that I don't think was reported on uh, was we put a, a new stream of funding for uh, child care services at CUNY. So for uh, not, not all, but predominantly women who are getting a higher education, who have a family and have to balance the needs of getting that higher education and childcare. We put in a few hundred thousand dollars and Councilmember Barron was deeply involved in advocating for this uh, to get childcare centers to provide uh, either free or low cost childcare at different CUNY institutions all across the city. It's the first year we did that and it's something that I hope to build on because um, we want to see how it goes. CUNY was excited about it. The women of the council were the biggest folks uh, pushing for it in the budget. I'm proud of that and you know, um, uh, again, I, I, I don't say this in a, in a critical way, we really, um, it doesn't go to the exact thing about childcare uh, specifically, but you know, we expanded, and I don't know if it's been fully reported on, I don't think it has been, we expanded our policy here at the city council. I think we have the most generous policy now mm -hmm. as it relates to um, a, a new parent, both uh, uh, men and women, um, in getting uh, a certain amount of time off um, where they're being uh, paid in full. I think literally we have the best policy in the entire city of New York. Um, and so I'm really proud of that. I, I worked on that the first few months of this year and it was announced a few months ago and some of the great staff here at the council are currently um, using that leave as they should as new parents, which is wonderful. So uh, 
um, there are a variety of things we should we can do, and I think we'll keep exploring that. If anyone wants to say anything specific on this, I think it's a conversation we want to keep adding. Yes, majority of the combo. I'm glad you asked that because it was a resolution I didn't get to speak on today, but it's also an issue we're taking up in the council, which is resolution 358. This calls upon the city of New York to eliminate the disparity in compensation paid to teachers, staff, and directors at community-based early learn New York City centers as compared to compensation paid to Department of Education instructors for similar employment. So pay parity is a huge issue that we are looking at because my 14-month-old son, boy, does he need a lot in terms of energy, in terms of education, and this level of education, when a child is forming its mind in the first two years, which is the most critical time of a child's developmental um, aspects of his brain, are so important, and we need to compensate teachers who are doing this critical work and not look at it as babysitting and not that they have, and to say that they don't have the same skills or the same um, requirements. So we wanna create parity throughout. I'm also very proud of the work that the council did, as Speaker Corey Johnson said, um, around our CUNY educational centers, making sure that uh, students have an opportunity to receive an adequate education while uh, also pursuing their educational career and goals. So this is really, I mean, this council has been so comprehensive and proactive, and it's revolutionary to see the levels of change that we're seeing from childcare uh, to issues around protecting victims of sexual assault to making sure that our college campuses are safer. There's so much incredible work that we are doing all across the board, and I'm really just very proud of this body. So that's all I have to say. Steve, very quickly yeah. so yeah. we can get to off topic. Yes, sorry for that. Um, and I just want to say, on, on, for me, one of the motivations, when I was running, I talked a lot about making it easier for people to run and being more inclusive, and this is sort of part of that idea. Everything from you know contribution limits to um, you know and getting into the program, but also about making it so that people who want to run have the ability to do that. And we have, I would just say, we also have a number of personal experiences. Councilmember Cumbo spoke about hers, Councilmember Kalos, Levin, Reno. So we have a lot of new parents in the council. And when you hear them talk about the challenge of both being a caregiver or an expecting parent and having to run a race, we realize that that is one barrier to doing it. And we thought that, especially in light of um, the conversation around gender balance here in the council, that was a thing to, to help out. And that was one of my motivations for doing the bill uh, that we're voting on today. Thanks. Okay, off topic. Anyone? Going once. Going twice. I'm not dressing up. Um, I am uh, I'm going to, to dinner in the Bronx tonight. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, Any? I'm not going to the parade. Yeah, it's, uh, I love the parade, and I'm glad the parade exists, um, but I live along the parade route, and it's probably one of the more difficult nights of the entire year to live on that block. Um, the two craziest days and nights of the year are Gay Pride and Halloween uh, in, in the village and in uh, Chelsea. Uh, so I, I will not be there, but I think it's great, and I'm glad that it's gonna air live on New York One. Uh, I'm not having dinner with someone in public life. Uh, <laughs> I'm, having, uh, I'm having Italian. <laughs> Arthur Avenue, Richie Torres' district. Uh, I'm feeling a lot better. Goodbye. <laughs>